dear students welcome to our next <coughs> lecture on the series indian polity by m lakshmi kant so now we are going to lecture number 149 as i already said that we are coming to the close of this particular series that is indian polity by m lakshmi kant this would be lecture number 149 so this lecture we have almost cover whatever uh, <coughs> we have to cover in the lakshmi kant book so we covered <coughs> almost all the chapters uh, may not be in the same form but yes we have tried to cover the essence of all the chapters and then uh, we have also seen uh, the uh, last 5 years of uh, questions that has also been solved and then in the last class i have done 50 questions as practice questions so which is all related to the prelims examination so i thought that we'll take up one lecture we'll try to solve four five questions uh, which is related to the mains examination so how to solve the mains questions how to address that so that the students also get an idea as to how to solve the mains question so in this lecture we'll see as to what is relevant how to write a good mains answer what you have to keep in your mind and then there's also one more lecture that we'll go for that would be the last lecture <coughs> for that particular this series that is indian polity by m lakshmi kant in the next lecture uh, we'll have a walk through of what you have seen and with certain important tips as to how you can read this particular book that is indian polity by m lakshmi kant all right so before i get into the lecture today you can see that every year 10 to 12 questions does come from indian polity or if not 12 questions in your gs paper too at least you can expect 8 to 10 questions including governance it can be little more but uh, if you take off polity 8 to 10 questions out of 20 questions you can say half of the questions are going to be from your polity section so once you do the indian <coughs> polity by m lakshmi kant then of course you'll have to keep updating yourself with the relevant current information current events uh, important case laws Uh, certain issues that has a political nature uh, political nature as in which is related to the concepts like say separation of powers uh, developments with regard to judiciary or for that matter let us assume developments related to uh, <coughs> the executives or the legislature so you keep updating yourself with regard to these things important judgments certain commissions the recommendation of the commissions so once you keep updating yourself with all those things of course you will have enough points to write the main answer but having points per se will not help you in writing a good answer because a good answer is not only about content a good answer is also about your presentation so this lecture will try to see as to how you can present your answers well how you can <coughs> divide your answers and what is actually expected when you write a good answer and in addition to all those things how we can also enrich your answer so most of the students today know that they have to write uh, the answer in a specific format so probably they introduce uh, and then they write the body of the answer and then they finally conclude so this is a standard format this is written in point format or in paragraph format or in a hybrid model according to the strength of an individual candidate so individual to individual it can vary but then the point right now that i am trying to convey is that irrespective of the model that you follow how do you enrich your answers what you have to do to enrich your answers there are certain ways that you can enrich your answers that is what i am talking about so how come you enrich your answers now enrichment means say for example in addition to the other students what are you going to make it different are you going to give some examples are you going to give some case laws to substantiate your answers are you going to quote the reports of some of the committees or the commissions appointed by the government of india are you going to give up come up with certain state uh, data or statistics that could substantiate your answers so all these things are usually what is called as an enrichment and appropriate examples from the current events could also uh, uh, enhance your answers so what is very important in addition to the content which you present in a specific format where there is coherence in what you write in addition to that you also provide what is called as a lot of value additions by which you can enrich your answers all right so now we'll go we'll try to understand four five questions today as to how to write a good answer so this is exactly what we are looking forward in this particular lecture uh 
So this is Babu Gunashekaran, uh, Faculty for Indian Polity and Governance. I have also secured an IAS rank in Civil Service Examination 2016. So with that brief introduction, I'll just proceed further. We'll move to the first question that you are going to discuss today. So discuss the possible factors that inhibit India from enacting for its citizens an uniform civil code as provided for in the directive principles of state policy. So the question is making it very clear. The question is asking, the question is asking about a specific aspect of uniform civil code. The biggest problem with the students is once uh, they see a particular question, they start writing whatever they know about the question rather than writing what exactly is asked in the question. So what you'll have to do is first you'll have to look for what is asked in the question. That is what is more important. Then you structure the question. Then you provide the value additions. Uh, you enrich your answers, whatever be it. But first try to understand as to what is the demand in the question. So discuss the possible factors. So first you will have to understand, discuss the possible factors. Discuss the possible factors that inhibit India from enacting for its citizens and uniform civil code as provided in the directive principles of state policy. That means the question is asking you to examine, debate, discuss as to what are the possible reasons that prevent our country from having a uniform civil code. It is not asking more you to write about just about the uniform civil code, which anyways I am sure that any student is prepared who has cleared the prelims examination is very much aware of uniform civil code. But the moment they see such questions, students get overwhelmed. They start writing whatever they know about uniform civil code rather than what has been asked in the question. So if you read this particular question, the crux of this question is about the factors that inhibit India. So what are the factors in our country do you think that inhibit uh, from having a uniform civil code? It could be a, a political factor, it could be a social cultural factors, uh, it could be <coughs> religious factors. And in addition to that, a number of other factors as well, practical issues, but your answers has to focus upon them. Your answers has to substantiate that. And then of course, finally, you can discuss the other side also. And then finally, you can conclude your answers, but that is exactly what is required rather than just keep on explaining about the uniform civil code. But yes, you can start with explaining as to what is an uniform civil code. So in the introduction, you can briefly discuss, so because the question is about uniform civil code and it is also mentioning uh, the directive principles of state policy. So article 44 is something that you can use. Article 44 can be used as an uh, enhancer, it can enrich. You are trying to put some article which not many students might put it. So in that way you can differentiate your answer. You can just uh, talk about article 44 and then you can define as to what is an uniform civil code. A code which would ensure that with regard to the personal matters like marriage, divorce, inheritance of property. Uh, in all these areas, there would be a uniform set of laws across the religion, which right now we do not have in our country and that would be a uniform civil code. So if you want, you can say that Goa is the only state which has a uniform civil code, but otherwise there is no uniform civil code. So briefly explain, don't have to explain more than this. Because the question is not more on uniform civil code, but the question is about what factors in inhibit. That is what actually you will have to write it in the body part. In the body, you will have to come here and you will have to explain as to what are the factors that does inhibit the uniform civil code. So, to write the answers better, try to give multiple dimensions. You can have the socio-cultural factors. You can talk about the religious factors because this is example. Uh, that has this is exactly what has happened in the constant assembly that there are certain members in the constant assembly who wanted to have uniform civil code as a part of the fundamental right but then many members thought that because of <coughs> the practices the religious practices and the other socio cultural aspects related to that you cannot make both the right to freedom of religion and the uniform civil code as a part of fundamental right because they thought that this would be incompatible they would be incompatible with one another and hence it is not possible. So yes, of course, yes, socio-cultural factors or the religious uh, factors could be one of the reasons. So socio-cultural, religious, practical factors, practical issues. So there is also a practical issue. People are not educated. Uh, people believe in their religious practices. How are you going to practically implement all those things? Uh, it can create a divide among the people. Uh, you cannot do it through coercion. 
so that is again an issue and then political factors is there a political will to do that so in this way you can divide and you can try to give multiple dimensions always trying to give multiple dimensions will definitely fetch you better marks and if possible you can write down some examples so these are all the factors yes that is definitely preventing holding india from having a uniform silk code but there are also reasons as to why you want to have an uniform silk code you can definitely put that also as a part of your body itself so what are the reasons that you feel that yes but despite all these factors the reasons why do you think that there is a need for an uniform silk code one is the violation of fundamental rights you can talk about the violation of fundamental rights you can definitely put it uh, especially uh, <coughs> you see where uh, the gender justice is not there there is violation of uh, right to equality is there uh, so you can put across those things with some examples if you want so violation of fundamental rights gender injustice so in order to address all those things we need to have what is called as an uniform silk code so you have just started with defining the uniform silk code article 44 what are the factors inhibit is majorly but still you wanted to have a uniform silk code and then finally you come and conclude your answers so how do you conclude your answers so you conclude your answers by saying that what you exactly feel about it so despite these challenges whether you wanted to have a uniform silk code you do not want to have a uniform silk code or what is the approach that could be there to address exactly the issues that you have placed as a part of our answer also so if you feel that yes there is a need for uniform silk code you can take up the supreme court judgments as well you can quote one or two judgments which had been in favor of having a uniform silk code say for example you can talk about the shah banu case where there was the supreme court judgment is was in favor of having a uniform silk code or if you want to take a midway approach because of all these challenges the practical difficulties you can talk about the recommendation of law commission of india which talks about the incremental approach so whatever you feel like you can put it in the conclusion but make sure that your conclusion is sensible it is rational and it is practical that is what is very important it should not be irrational it should not be impractical and uh, and it should not be a very emotional kind of argument also it has to be rational it should be constitutional it should be legal it should be practical so you'll have to find uh, something as a part of your conclusion which is equally placed from all these areas and then you can conclude your answers we'll move to the next question so in a similar way we'll try to answer uh, the next question also so once you understand as to what exactly you will have to answer for so what is very important is first you will have to look out for what exactly you will have to answer in that particular question so once you understand that once you understand the directives in the question then it becomes very easy so the last question that you have seen is an upsc question was asked in upsc a very important area uniform civil code which is <coughs> likely to be asked in the future also that's why i picked that particular question which is from the directive principles of state policy and then the question that we are going to discuss right now is from the part three of the constitution that is from the fundamental rights again a very important area and especially from article 19 article 19 and article 21 these are the two important areas where regularly questions being asked so let us try to understand as to how to solve this particular question so let us first read the question what do you understand by the concept of freedom of speech and expression So it's a very direct question what do you understand by the concept of freedom of speech and expression that means uh, you'll have to explain as to what is your understanding of the concept of freedom of speech and expression and then does it cover hate speech also uh, or in other words the question is trying to assess your understanding that whether the right to freedom of speech and expression allows an individual to engage in what is called as hate speech can an individual <coughs> seek protection for hate speech under the grounds of right to freedom of speech and expression why do films in india stand on a slightly different plane from other forms of expression discuss so the last part of the thing is discuss debate examine and try to give us the understanding why the films in india which is also a form of right to freedom of speech and expression but it stand on a different plane when it when we say that it stands on a different plane probably there is a different level of protection or probably there is a different level of restriction but in any way how it stands on a different plane that is exactly what you will have to understand so we will try to understand and answer all these questions 
So again, you can uh, um, uh, start the question. You can have an introduction uh, for this particular question. Introduction, a quite easy uh, introduction that you can give is that you can talk about Article 19. To be very specific, you can talk about Article 19, Class 1, Sub Clause A. Article 19, Class 1, Sub Clause A provides for right to freedom of speech and expression. And then if you want to explain further, you can explain as to what is this right to freedom of speech and expression. Explain it also. Or you can <coughs> define it. First, you can define it in the process of explaining it. So, I would say you can start with defining the right to freedom of speech and expression. So, what is, how do you define? The constitution does not define the right to freedom of speech and expression. But what is the understanding you may have is that this is a set of right that is given to an individual to express his ideas, thoughts, viewpoints in whichever way he wanted to express it. It can be in the form of writing, it can be in the form of printing, it can be in the form of picturing, it can be in the form of verbal or non-verbal communication. He is free to express all those things. So that is exactly what is called as a right to freedom of speech and expression. And as a continuation of that, probably you can write in the body part. So you are continuing the explanation. You just define as to what is it. So you are continuing the explanation of what is this right to freedom of speech and expression. Now, this right to freedom of speech and expression in the process of explaining that you can say it is very important because it is essence of participatory democracy. It is important for what? It is important for participatory democracy. For example, without right to freedom of speech and expression, how can you question the government? How can you criticize the government? How can you protest against the government? So, for all those things, you need to have what is called as the right to freedom of speech and expression, which allows you to participate in the governance. And then, few more examples can also give if you want. So, it allows you to participate in the, part, in the governance process. It has a lot of other rights, say for example, right to freedom of press, uh, right to protest, right to remain silent. So, if you want, you can give the, uh, I would say, uh, the list of rights which is implied under Article 19, Class 1, Sub Class A, you can give a note on that also. But then what is very important here is, we are coming to the second part, you are making a transition from the first part to the second part, does it cover the hate speech also? But you cannot directly write, no, it does not have a hate speech, you, you should have a continuity, you should have a sequence in the way that you write. So here you can, after explaining all these things, you can say, but however, the right to freedom of speech and expression, is not absolute, but it comes with reasonable restriction. This is what is very, very important. You make the examiner understand that it is not absolute, but it can be exercised with reasonable restrictions. <clears throat> it is exercised with what? It is exercised with reasonable restrictions. All right, so that is exactly what you will have to understand. So, it can be exercised with reasonable restrictions. So, it can be restricted on number of ways. So, hate speech is one of the reasonable restrictions. So, you can of, of course say that it does come with reasonable restrictions. So, we are also not allowed to engage in what is called as hate speech. So, in the process, you can also define what is called as hate speech. So, you can define as what is hate speech and you can explain that. You can give some examples of hate speech. These are value additions. Uh, although there is no specific law today with regard to hate speech, but say for example, section 153A of IPC and you have section 123A uh, of Representation of People Act 1951, uh, which all related to some form of, when it comes to hate speech, where the speech which is used to create problem or speech which is used to create uh, some form of problems between two different sections of the society, then that could be seen, which is likely to provoke violence. They can be seen as what is called as hate speech. So, today, yes, right to freedom of speech and expression is there, but it cannot extend to what is called as hate speech because the very idea of the rights or the liberty that is granted is that that is not absolute in character. It can be reasonably restricted. So, you can give these examples and you can say that the hate speech is not allowed. Now, coming to the last part of the question, why do you think that the films in India stand on a slightly different plane from other forms of communication? So, first of all, you can write before going to that. You can continue this in the next paragraph in the body part itself. Uh, films are also a part of expression. 
because you make a movie and you convey an information to the audience so it is also a form of expression but today that is regulated under what is called as the indian cinematographic act so first you talk about the indian cinematographic act Indian Cinematographic Act 1952. So, why this Cinematographic Act 1952 is very relevant? Because the Cinematographic Act provides for the Central Board for Film Certification. And as per the Central Board for Film Certification, today the films are certified into different categories. And only after the certification process is over, only after the movie is censored, then they can be allowed. So, how it is different? So, the key word here is the pre censorship. So, the pre censorship what makes it is exactly this pre censorship that makes the films on a different plane from other forms of communication. Today, somebody wanted to publish an uh, article in a newspaper, somebody wanted to publish a book, they are not pre censored. So, they may be censored after they have been published, after they are circulated. Imposition bans can be imposed after the publication. But pre censorship happens only in case of what is called as movies. Now, the question is why it is put for a pre censorship, which is basically done by the Central Board for Film Certification. You will have to explain that, that is what is very important. So, as far as I am concerned, the reasons could be manifold. Say, for example, uh, the reach to the masses. While movies can reach the masses, people do not, not everybody reads a book, but everybody can watch the movie. People model the actor and the actress. So, the message that they convey through movies could be really persuasive, it can have an impact upon their behavior. So, because of the reach, because of the impact on the behavior, uh, because of the influence of the ideas, the attitudes that the movies can have, they have to be put and the psychological implications that they can have on the behavior and the attitude of the people. It is very, very important that what is being conveyed is pre -sensor. otherwise the impact could be very heavy and that is the reason that the movies in our country are pre -sensor. So, you will have to explain this particular part as to why it is pre -sensor as a part of your answer. Okay? You just try to break the questions in different ways and then finally, <coughs> you are discussing that, you, you are explaining that, debating that and if you feel that yes, there is too much of pre censorship, you can do that also because it is giving you scope to discuss and to examine the things. And then finally, you conclude your answers. So, you are giving your conclusion. So, in the conclusion, you can write about the very essence of Article 19. While on the one hand, Article 19 provides for right to freedom of speech and expression, which allows the different ways one can express, but that right to freedom of speech and expression is also not absolute in character. And why it is not provided absolute in character? Because the interest of the individuals, the individual liberty and the societal welfare has to be protected equally or there has to be some kind of balance between these two areas. And that is exactly why the rights are guaranteed, but the rights do come with what is called as a reasonable restriction. All right. So, with that, we will proceed to the next question. You see the next question, uh, question number three in the discussion. The question is asking about instance of president's delay in commuting death sentences have come under public debate as dinner of justice. There were instances when this question was asked. Uh, the president, we know, has a pardoning power under Article 72 of the Constitution, but that power is not to be exercised with the reasonable time. The reasonable time is not given in the constitution. So, there were instances this power uh, is not exercised and the mercy petitions has been kept pending for the president for a long period of time. That is one of the reason as to why this particular question was asked. Should there be a time limit specified for the president to accept or to reject the petitions? Analyze. So, this is again very, very important when you talk of uh, sh should there be a time limit for the president to take all the decisions. So, it is more an opinionated question. So, so it, it requires uh, you to come out and give an opinion, but yes, your opinion can always be substantiated with certain Supreme Court judgment or uh, reports or the uh, uh, recommendations given by any commissions that can be used to add value to your answer. So, here it is all asking about analyze. Analyze means uh, think about it, think deeper about it and then come out with your answer. 
examine in depth that's what is the meaning of the word analyze so now what are the things that could be related to this particular question so incidents of precedent delay in commuting the death sentence have come under the public uh, public debate as the denial of justice so it's more related to article 72 of the constitution so if, what you can introduce your introduction has to go to so because everything related to this is related to the president power to pardon a death sentence or to commute the offenses okay so that is article 72 of the constitution you can just explain the crux of article 72 under article 72 of the constitution we know the president exercises a set of powers he has a power to pardon he has a power to commute remit reprieve respite uh, the offenses uh, but all these offenses where the executive power of the union extends and he can exercise in case of court martial also so briefly if you want you can just give an introduction to article 72 of the constitution now should there be a time limit specified for the president to accept or to reject these petition that's the second part of the question so that's where is the body part so here you give a hint as to what is article 72 you don't have to talk about the governor but if you want you can mention article 161 and the governor also but i don't see a need to do that because the question is very categorically asking about the president's delay but if you want you can do that so no harm in that but whether you will get an extra mark i am not sure with regard to this now in the body part you will have to explain the objectives as to why this has been some kind of rationality some kind of reason uh, as to why this power has been given to the president in the first place so there are two objectives majorly the criminal justice system in our country is reformative in nature it is reformative in nature and then it is also to rectify what is called as the judicial errors so to avoid any form of judicial errors which may happen because the judges are also human beings so errors can happen in the judgment which can be rectified through these mercy petitions and most importantly the question is talking about what it is specifically talking about that the president's delay in commuting death sentences have come under public scrutiny as come under public debate in denial of justice should there be a time limit so your discussion has to focus on this part so but how do you discuss do you have anything that is backing you yes we have a couple of judgments which you can explain so most importantly the first case is the chatruhan shaugan case you can mention that Chatrugan Chauhan. The Chatrugan Chauhan versus the Union of India case in 2014. The Supreme Court categorically said in this particular case, if there is an inordinate delay, because what happens is whenever there is a death punishment, whenever there is a capital punishment, uh, the individuals can apply and seek the mercy of the president. That is very much possible under Article 72 of the Constitution. And in fact, uh, under this article, there is no right to oral hearing. So, they cannot go and file an oral hearing. They can just file the petition. Once the petition is filed, now, what is the time limit for which or within which the president has to act on this? The time limit is not mentioned in the constitution. It is not mentioned. It is not prescribed. In the absence of such prescribed time limit, the president takes his own time. In fact, when I say that the president takes his time, the Supreme Court has already made it very clear in number of cases that this power is not exercised by the president himself. <coughs> this power is exercised by uh, the president based on the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers. So, in fact, it is a government which has to recommend. But anyways, there is no time limit that is mentioned. So, what has happened after because of this is that in number of cases, there is an inordinate delay. So, inordinate means it is an unreasonable delay. There is an unreasonable delay in number of cases. And in fact, in the Chatruhan Shauhan versus Union of India case, the Supreme Court has made it very clear if there is any inordinate delay in exercising the power, the president uh, takes a lot of time in deciding this, then that is a fit case for what? That the fit, there is a fit case for, uh, for commuting the death sentence or it is a mitigating factor. This is exactly what the Supreme Court has said. It is a mitigating factor in commuting or in reducing the punishment. So, mitigating factor means factors that could reduce the severity of an offense. 
and factors that could help and accused. That's basically what is called as uh, uh, factors that could help an accused or factors that could help and convict in this particular case. So it is a mitigating factor so that you can reduce or you can commute the capital punishment to what is called as a life imprisonment or whatever. So this is one interesting case where the Supreme Court has favored in a way that the president has to exercise his power uh, within a reasonable time frame and he should not unnecessarily delay. A similar case on this particular line is also a V. Streheran case. So, just give me a moment. You can see V. Uh, Streheran case. If you see this V. Streheran case, so an interesting case is also V. Streheran case. In B. Streheran case, a similar uh, su uh, Supreme Court has given a similar judgment that there should not be an inordinate delay. There should not be inordinate delay in precedent disposing the mercy petitions. If there is an inordinate delay, uh, in fact, the Supreme Court has gone to the extent and it said that inordinate delay in disposing the mercy petitions is violative of the right to life and liberty under Article 21 of the Constitution. So, it has been considered to be <coughs> violative of right to life and liberty. In fact, it is <coughs> violative of the dignified life of an individual because a person who has applied for a mercy petition cannot be kept under uh, uh, dark for a long period of time without knowing what will happen to him. So, that will not amount to what is called as a dignified life, which was seen as a violation of right to life and liberty. And hence, the Supreme Court made it very clear inordinate ground is inordinate delay is an absolutely uh, acceptable ground on which the commutation of death sentence can happen. And in fact, uh, this Stiharan case is related to number of people who is related to Rajiv Gandhi assassination case. Today, many people uh, and their death capital punishment has been commuted uh, by the same reason. So, in this case also, the Supreme Court said that the president has to exercise his power with a reasonable time frame. So, what they have said is it has to be exercised within a reasonable time frame. But what exactly is a reasonable time frame that has not been mentioned, but that means again there is an element of subjectivity or I would say that there is an element of discretion in the hands of the president. So, which you can write after all these things, probably you can say that the Supreme Court may issue guidelines in this particular regard as to what shall be the reasonable time frame in order to protect the right to life and liberty of the people and at the same time. There should not be a public perception that uh, the uh, authorities who are in constitutional position, they are not uh, disregarding their duties and they are supposed to exercise their duties because we know that justice delayed is also equal to what is called as justice denied and it is very important that the justice is delivered on time. So, all those things can also be part of your conclusion and accordingly you can conclude your answers. So, you wrote all these things. The only thing is you can come out with a suggestion of what could be the possible reasonable time frame. So that is something that you can suggest, but you can do all those things as a part of your conclusion. So, with that you can conclude this particular answer. Okay. We will move to the next question that is, the next question is also a very important question and uh, it also can be asked in the examination in the coming years as well. So, already it has been asked, but it can be asked again, uh, again because it is related to a current topic also, which is related to the National Judicial Appointments Commission. All right. So, we will try to understand as to what exactly is uh, this particular uh, uh, question is all about. So, critically examined. So, this word is very, very important. So, critically examined means that <coughs> uh, the question is trying to tell you to come out with a fair assessment or a fair judgment. That is what is very important. You make a fair assessment of the issue that is given at hand. So, critically examine the Supreme Court judgment on the National Judicial Appointments Commission Act 2014 with reference to the appointment of judges in higher judiciary. Okay, you now know a number of constitutional provisions and then what we follow today, uh, what has uh, been followed today is the collegium system. And uh, the crux of this entire question, I am not organizing the question, the crux of this entire question is uh, to do away with the collegium system, uh, the 99th Constitutional Amendment Act was brought in. So, most of you might be knowing about this. 
and the 99th constitutional amendment act was struck down by the supreme court and in fact the supreme court said that it is in violation of the independence of judiciary in fact the independence of judiciary was also declared to be part of the basic structure so now the entire question is about the critical assessment of this what do you think about the judgment so what are in favor of the judgment what are against the judgment and then finally you conclude your answers that's exactly what is required in this particular question so how do you start and how do you proceed and how do you conclude what matters using all the information that i have said so now let us see as to how you can start this uh, particular question so critically uh, examine the uh, the supreme court judgment on the national judicial appointments commission act 2014 you can start with explaining as to what is the uh, national judicial appointments commission act or you can uh, uh, in the introduction you can talk about the 99th constitutional amendment act so introduction you directly talk about the 99th constitutional amendment act 2014 which provided for the njac and what is this njac you can explain this national judicial appointments commission is to replace the collegium system that's exactly the idea we know that that the njac was to replace the collegium system so this much is sufficient in the introduction part so now come to the body part so here in the body you can explain uh, as to what is a collegium system but before doing that just to add value to your answers just to enrich your answers you can use couple of articles if you want that's article 240 uh, article 124 and article 217 of the constitution so this is how the articles can come handy which can actually add value to your answers under article 124 of the constitution it talks about uh, the appointment of the judges of the supreme court similarly article 217 of the constitution talks about appointment of the judges of the high courts but in both the cases it is saying that it is to be appointed by the president although you don't have to explain this very much you can just say that under these articles the judges of the supreme court and the higher court are to be appointed by the president in consultation with uh, chief justice of india and certain other judges there are few differences but overall you can write the consultation is that with the chief justice of india plus certain other judges that is what is given in the constitution but despite the fact that what is given here what we follow today is the collegium system and you can say that the collegium system if you want to explain you can explain the collegium system if you already explain you don't have to explain that so what is this collegium system today is a system of appointment where the judges appoint the judges the judges a group of judges will recommend the names of the judges to the higher judiciary and they are appointed by the president so you can give an idea as to today despite the fact that this is what is given in the constitution based on the judges case so this is a way that you can enrich your answer it is through the judges case the collegium system came into existence so now you can say that this collegium system was struck down or you can say that this collegium system was to be replaced by njac which was done by the 99th constitutional amendment act so you can make a reference of njac here so this is exactly what the njac has trying to replace and that was struck down by the supreme court in the fourth judges case so given all the information now comes your critical assessment part which is i would say the most important part in the answer so the critical assessment is that you are going to now determine you are going to critically assess the everything whether njac is good or collegium is good so why the collegium has been upheld by the supreme court why njac was struck down by the supreme court so what do you think is something that you can put it in your conclusion but this assessment that means you have to debate on the positives the merits and demerits of having a collegium system so first what are the merits so because the supreme court has struck it uh, struck it down the NG, uh, national judicial appointments commission what do you think is the merits of having the collegium system in the words of the supreme court of india this ensures what is called as the independence of judiciary independence of judiciary that is something that you can put it 
and ensuring the independence of judiciary is very very important and in fact they declared this independence of judiciary to be part of the basic structure in this case and they wanted to have what is called as the independence of judiciary now by ensuring the independence of judiciary the supreme court is also opinion they can play an effective role as what is the guardian of the constitution you know the supreme court is the guardian of the constitution that is the constitutional mandate and for which they have to be independent and to ensure the independence the judges should be in a position to ascertain who would be appointed as the judges they are in the best position to ascertain that that's the basic fundamental philosophy behind striking down the national judicial appointments commission but what are the demerits in fact in the same njic case the supreme court acknowledges the fact that not everything is well with the collegium system that means they themselves accept there are few shortcomings in the collegium system and they are willing to work on the shortcomings so what are the various drawbacks of this collegium system one you see that the drawback of the collegium system is today there is lack of transparency there is no transparency as to who is appointed as a judges or in the sense what are the factors based on which certain names are recommended there is absolutely no transparency there is no absolutely no accountability whether the judges perform well or they do not perform well and it is also said an element of nepotism has crept into so lack of transparency nepotism transparency and you can add accountability as well so lack of transparency nepotism accountability so these are all some of a very serious concerns with regard to the present collegium system in fact as i already said in the uh, case in 2015 in the njic case then chief justice of india justice keher has openly said that is yes, the collegium system has some problems but that doesn't mean that we have to do with the collegium system so that is why they accepted what they have said is that there will be a memorandum of procedure mop that would be developed by both the supreme court of india and the government of india this memorandum of procedure will try to address and identify the issues in the present collegium system but no way we can completely do with the collegium system so this memorandum of procedure something can be used as a part of the answer if you feel that yes collegium has to continue but yes you can be critical also because it is about the critical examination not necessarily that you don't have to go against a judgment but if you go against a judgment then the problem is that you'll have to give very strong reasons for that now how do you give strong reasons now say for example you can say that no other democratic country in the world has got the collegium system india is the only country among all the democratic countries which has got a collegium system most of the countries across the world they have got one or the other form of national judicial appointments commission uh, if you see the national judicial appointments commission uh, is where there are representation from the executives and the legislature and they make the appointment to the judiciary or from the outsiders that's exactly maintains the checks and balances that goes with, uh, with the principle of what is called as separation of powers so you can put all those things if you want to say that njsc should not be, njsc should be there and collegium should system should be done away with or if you are in favor of collegium system because the present chief justice of india has said that uh, yes this is the best possible means of appointment that we have today that is the collegium system if you are of that opinion you can say that yes the memorandum of procedure has to be there which can streamline and eliminate the drawbacks in the collegium system and continue with advantages in the collegium system which is protecting and ensuring the independence of judiciary all right so with that we'll move to the next question uh, we'll see as to what is the next question see the next question uh, <clears throat> next question is again a current topic so it has been asked earlier also so even today it is part of the current topic so we'll see as to what this question is all about so look into question number 5 so question number 5 in today's discussion is talking about the topic of simultaneous election so simultaneous election to lok sabha and the state assemblies will limit the amount of time and money spent in the electioneering but it will reduce the government's accountability to the people discuss so the question itself is giving that uh, the idea of simultaneous election has some advantages the advantages in terms of uh, reducing the money and the reducing the time uh, that is spent in the elections 
but at the same time the idea of simultaneous elections uh, can reduce what the accountability of uh, the government to the people so that is what is given in the question and the question is asking you to discuss this in fact this is a question that was asked in 2017 but again this question may be asked so discuss here means you can debate you can uh, look into this particular matter examine this particular matter and you can give an opinion on this particular matter okay so again i would say this is again an opinionated question so once uh, you see that in upsc in upsc today a lot of opinion oriented question is being asked okay so that's again very very important so whenever certain issues comes so you should also have various opinions on that you will have to uh, consolidate your opinions and then substantiate those opinions with uh, certain enrichments like uh, opinion given by the expert committees supreme court judgments that actually can add value as i already said now come to the question so this question can be definitely answered only when you know as to what is the concept of simultaneous election in the first place so that has to be given in the introduction itself in my opinion so simultaneous elections its advantages its disadvantages and then finally you can conclude your answers so basically what exactly is the concept of a simultaneous election so this idea of simultaneous election was put forward by uh, prime minister narendra modi so after he has come to power in 2014 the idea of simultaneous election came in and then subsequently after that uh, number of times it has uh, been discussed today i think a special uh, commission is appointed to look into this particular matter of whether to have a simultaneous election or not so but what exactly is simultaneous election now simultaneous election is a concept where simultaneously you conduct election to the lok sabha as well as to the legislative assemblies of all the states today we have 28 states in our country and certain union territories do have legislative assemblies so now the question is is it possible that we simultaneously carry out the elections to both the lok sabha as well as the legislative assemblies that's the question if that happens then that would come with a point of what is called as the simultaneous election. So, can the simultaneous election happen? And what are the advantages of having a simultaneous elections? But is it possible in the first place to happen constitutionally? And in that case, what are the various challenges, the advantages, the disadvantages of having a simultaneous election? And then finally, your uh, viewpoint on this particular matter. That is what is exactly asked in this particular question. So initially, if you see at after the commencement of the constitution, uh, so today uh, there is no simultaneous election. I'll just come back to what happened at the commencement of the constitution. Today there is no simultaneous election. So today the election to the Lok Sabha happens at different point in point in time, but may be possible that uh, some of the legislative assembly elections are also coming uh, are due at that point of time. So for few legislative assemblies and the Lok Sabha elections can happen simultaneously. But having the elections to all the 28 states along with few union territories and the Lok Sabha elections does not happen in our country. It may not happen in the present because there is no concept of what is called a simultaneous election. If this happens, that is exactly what is called as a simultaneous election. But at the commencement of the constitution, you see, although there is no constitutional design per se, but in 1952, the Lok Sabha elections happened. And then subsequently, the legislative assembly elections also happened because that is when the constitution came into force and then subsequently the elections started happening. And then the term of the Lok Sabha being five years and the term of the legislative assembly being also five years. So it happened naturally that is for some time the simultaneous elections happened. And also because of the fact that there was Congress government both in the center and the states and most of these governments were really stable governments. So, although it was not a constitutional design of having a simultaneous elections for first few years, at least for the couple of decades from 1952 starting till 1967 elections, uh, there was simultaneous election. So, what could be the possible advantages of having the simultaneous election? Yes, of course, one of the advantage could be it could reduce the money that is being used. Uh, it uh, reduces the time where the political parties spend on electioneering and campaigning and all those things. This is exactly, in fact, what uh, Prime Minister Modi is saying. That once there is a simultaneous election, a lot of uh, time which is spent on the electioneering process, the campaigning process could brought down. Uh, a lot of corrupt activities can be reduced. Uh, the money 
uh, can wastage can be reduced. So, automatically it can be used for good governance. So, these are all definitely the advantages. Nobody can deny these advantages. But of course, there are certain disadvantages. What do the critics say with regard to the disadvantages? Now, as per the political scientist, the major disadvantage is simultaneous election should not happen because when simultaneous election happens, there can be an advantage to the national party over the regional parties. And the national issues can mask the regional issues. But however, you see people vote in the elections and in there are certain parties which is victorious at the national level but not state level because of the fact that the election has to be fought on different grounds and different stakes are there at different elections. So, in the national election that is in the Lok Sabha election, the national issues are the dominant factor whereas in the state elections, the local factors, the local problem should be the dominant factor. But this may not be the case if there is a simultaneous election. So, somewhere the national issues can mask the regional issues that can be to the disadvantage of the regional parties and could be to the advantage of the national parties. Will that amount to what is called as a free and fair election is a question. So, the national parties will have an edge and hence there should be no uh, simultaneous election. And apart from that, some of the critics are also critical of this particular concept of uh, simultaneous election because they feel that it will go against the federal provisions of the constitution. When you say federal provisions of the constitution, the states shall derive its power from the constitution itself and so is the center. But if there is a simultaneous election, there is a possibility that the regional parties may not have a say in the election process, which may be completely taken up by the national parties and over a period of time that can also downgrade the concept of federalism in our country. That is again a concern which may happen or may not happen, but that is a concern that has been shown by the political scientists. So, of course, yes, there are advantages, there are disadvantages. So, now you will have to come to a conclusion as to whether, yes, we can go for simultaneous election or the simultaneous election is not good. So, if you believe in simultaneous election, you can say that we can go for simultaneous election because it has its own advantages, especially more time to focus on the good governance. But even for that, you should take note of the practical difficulties. Someone who is not in favor of simultaneous election, so they can also talk about the practical difficulties. So, even someone who is in favor, they should not write, yes, we should go for the simultaneous election without knowing as to what could be the practical difficulties. Because it requires a lot of amendments, not only to the constitution, but also to the representation of People's Act. And of course, to many provisions in the constitution as well. So, once we do that, then we can go to simultaneous election. But as yes, simultaneous elections will definitely have the threat to the regional parties and regional parties today power in number of states. You can see like state like Tamil Nadu, state like uh, uh, Karnataka, so sorry, states like Kerala, states like West Bengal, they are able to bargain with the center. And if all the states are the same uh, state as that of what, as that of the national party, probably to what extent the federal provisions in the constitution will be live in terms of its spirit is something that is questionable, that is what the critics say. The regional parties are able to uh, negotiate with the center and with that negotiation, the spirit of federalism is very much alive in our country. Will that spirit be there in case if there is a simultaneous election, that is a question mark. That is exactly what you can put it in your comments or in, in your conclusion also. So, in your conclusion, you can just put it as to uh, whether you feel that there should be a simultaneous election or you feel that no, simultaneous election is not good. The country is not up to a simultaneous election, which also requires a lot of constitutional amendment. You are free to write anything because it is more or less an opinionated question. And apart from whatever discussion we have, you are also free to think about these things and if you want to put something in the comment box regarding the conclusion, you can also do that, alright. So, with that, we will move to the last question for discussion today and with that, we will end our discussion. So, the last question for discussion is again uh, from an important topic that is uh, the National Human Rights Commission. So, the way I have picked up the question for today's discussion, you see I have picked up one question from uh, the Directive Principles of State Policy, uh, especially the Uniform Civil Code, which is a very relevant topic. And then I have taken up one question from the Fundamental Rights. One question I have taken it from Judiciary, the National Judicial Appointments Commission. 
one is from the electoral process simultaneous elections one is from the constitutional body statutory bodies and all those things so every year there is a question that is coming from this particular area one a question from the executive topic so in this way i was just trying to cover up each and everything that is given in the syllabus and apart from that there are also other areas from where the question can come especially from the uh, legislature part uh, from the representation of people act so those are all the areas where the question can be asked but almost all the questions has to be answered in the same manner you understand what is given in the question what is exactly the question is asking what are the directives in the question so once you understand that you will be in a position to answer the questions all right so come to the last question for the discussion national human rights commission so nhrc in india can be most effective when it take when its uh, task are adequately supported by other mechanisms that ensure the accountability of the government so that means it's very clear today nhrc functions is not very effective but it could be made effective when its tasks are supported by other mechanisms in the light of the above observation assess the role of nhrc as effective complement to the judiciary and other institutions in promoting and protecting the human rights standards now nhrc has a very important role to play and that's why we have a human rights act and this human rights act provides for the establishment of nhrc so today nhrc is a statutory body a very important statutory body and in fact this was brought in this law was brought in through which the nhrc was established to give uh, or i would say to uh, uh, as uh, an india's commitment to i would call india's commitment to protecting the human rights so it is with the intention of giving life to india's commitment to various international organizations with regard to protection of human rights this human rights act was passed and this human rights act was established as established this national human rights commission which is providing for what is called as which is a statutory body today now there are certain problems of course that nhrc suffers from but at the same time if these problems are addressed how nhrc could help the judiciary and the other institutions which are protecting the fundamental which are protecting the rights of the people that is basically what the question is looking for okay so you can give an introduction in your introduction you can talk about the human rights act very briefly so this is to ensure india's commitment to us protecting the human rights so this is all can be part of your introduction now once you are done with your introduction so you'll have to move forward and we'll have to understand as to what exactly is the issues that is faced by the nhrc and before you talk about the issues faced by the nhrc you can also discuss about the functions briefly so the major function of nhrc is to look into the violation of the human rights by the government excess so for example in jails uh, uh, in uh, police stations the police torture so wherever there is a government excess the nhrc can send notice they can look into those things fake encounters in fact nhrc has a power to take up so moto uh, cognizance of these cases very important so moto means by itself based on the newspaper reports and all those things so nhrc has a deterrent effect definitely but the deterrent effect is it sufficient enough and it can make recommendations for the relief uh, of the post of investigation so basically overall you can see nhrc acts as a watchdog in protecting the human rights especially against the government excess the government should not have an excess so against which this is allowed now the important thing that you have to understand is okay nhrc is performing all these functions but how effective it is in performing these functions does it suffer from any problem today in performing these functions that's exactly what you'll have to understand of course uh, the supreme court of india has said that nhrc it looks like a tiger but it is a toothless tiger although nhrc has lot of functions to perform but can it perform its functions effectively for many reasons nhrc is not able to perform its functions effectively first because of the reason that the nhrc does not have its own investigation wing the nhrc primarily depend on the government agencies and the government institutions to perform various functions so if the nhrc is to make the investigations they have to depend on the 
government officers, especially the police. Now, how do you think that they can investigate even against the police if they have to take the permit, if they have to depend on the police? And also the other government institutions. So, there is a lot of dependency with regard to investigation. They are not staffed with enough resources. They are not given adequate finances. And in fact, their appointment is politicized today. There is a lot of vacancies and if appointed, their appointment is also politicized. So, a lot of issues that are surrounding the NHRC. But however, NHRC does play an important role. So, every now and then NHRC makes a recommendation which is accepted by the government. So, in addition to what courts can do, the NHRC also supports in protecting the human rights of the people in our country. So, what could be the possible remedial measures? So, the remedial measures could be preventing the politicization, uh, staffing them sufficiently. Uh, so, these are all some of the measures. Uh, that could be used. In fact, you can say that the fund that is given to them can be made as a charge expenditure through an act of parliament. So, by these measures, you can definitely improve upon the standards of NHRC, which can play a very important role in protecting the human rights of the people, which uh, the state has almost, at least given at most uh, commitment in protecting the human rights. All right. So, by saying all these things, you can just conclude your answers. So, each and every question that we have discussed today is very important for your examination and each and every topic that I have picked today has been repeatedly asked in the exam. Okay. So, with that I am very sure the kind of discussion we had in all the questions will help you in giving some kind of insights in writing a better answer. Alright. So, with that we will, I will just wind up this uh, session for today. So, we are just left with one more session which by which we will conclude this series. So, this would be lecture number 149. There is one more lecture that I will do, lecture number 150. So, where I am planning to give a lecture to a long series that I have been doing, around uh, 110 to 120 hours of lecture. I, I do not have the track of the hours of lecture, but definitely it will be around more than 100 hours and we have got 150 lectures. So, before I conclude the lecture, one small announcement from Study IQ. Now, Study IQ has launched its batch 3 prelims to interview batch and uh, if you are interested in taking the courses you please go through the brochure and uh, going through the brochure and then uh, if you are interested because the course has got a number of interesting features you can have a clarity on these features and there are different validity for these courses and the courses are available in different languages and if you want an additional discount on any of these courses you can use my code babula all right so with that we'll wind up the session for today and if you have any queries related to any of the lectures or this particular lecture also, you can reach out to me through my telegram channel, Babu Gunashekaran337 or through my Instagram account, Babu Gunashekaran337. Thank you very much for watching this particular lecture. All the very best. God bless. Thank you.